Founded back in 1990, the Forum of Bible Agencies International, also known as FOBI, was born out of a need for understanding and partnership between organizations working in Bible translation. According to their website, they are a nonprofit made up of 40 members working together to maximize worldwide access and impact of God's Word in a trusted community of like-minded peers. Obviously, this is a huge player in the world of Bible translation, so let's dive in and learn more about it together. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. A lot of you have probably already heard of the Forum of Bible Agencies International, which from here on out, I will just call FOBI. But there's a lot of people out there who have heard of them, but haven't really dug deeper into who they are and some of their policies regarding Bible translation. So from their website, here's a little bit more what they say about themselves. They say, as an alliance of Bible agencies, the forum aims to, number one, strengthen interagency understanding and interpersonal relationships. Number two, encourage a collaborative culture to avoid duplication in ministry. I like that one. Number three, foster the professional excellence of its members through exchange of emerging and best practices. And finally, explore issues of common concern that stimulate thinking and identify trends. To do this, the forum focuses on four domains of international Bible ministry that have marked the historical efforts of the forum's membership. So, what are these four domains? Number one, the availability of Scripture for people through translation. Number two, engagement with Scripture by people as an outcome of accessibility. Number three, advocacy that helps to make Scripture relevant and credible in people's lives. And number four, innovations that render Scripture more meaningful to people wherever they are. Now, just about all the big players you've ever heard of who are involved in Bible translation or other Bible ministry stuff are members of this alliance. So, in North America, we have the American Bible Society, we have Biblica, Bible League Canada, Bible League International, the Bible Literacy Project, the Canadian Bible Society, Crossway, Deaf Bible Society, Door International, Faith Comes by Hearing, the Jesus Film Project, Mega Voice International, National Bible Association, Open Doors International, Scripture Union USA, Wycliffe Bible Translators USA, Wycliffe Bible Translators Canada, and version to name just a few of them. And that's just mainly North America. Then we have, of course, SIL, International, Wycliffe Global Alliance, United Bible Societies, Pioneer Bible Translators, Global Recordings Network, Life Words, One Hope. And there are a bunch in Australia, including the Bible Society of Australia, the Bible League, the Pocket Testament League, Gideons, etc., now, the FOBI board has come up with some basic principles and procedures for Bible translation that they can all agree on, and these are their resolutions or standards for Bible translations that happen within member organizations. One of the reasons it's important to know what these basic principles are is because if you want to use Paratext, the premier Bible translation software, and have access to all the beautiful resources that come with it that help you do Bible translation, then you have to be part of a registered group that abides by or has agreed to abide by the FOBI translation principles. So that's what we're going to do together. We're going to walk through in detail these standards for translation that they've laid out. And this is actually a lot of really good stuff. If you're interested in going into Bible translation or you are a Bible translator and you haven't yet studied these in detail, this might be a really good review for you. And this is definitely something you should be very familiar with. This is very well-worded, masterfully crafted. So here we go. 
While the forum agencies recognize that, depending on the particular translation situation, these principles and procedures are often applied in different ways, this statement serves as the common set of principles and procedures under which member agencies carry out their translation activities. As member organizations of the Forum of Bible Agencies International, we affirm the inspiration and authority of the Holy Scriptures and commit ourselves to the following goals. So, first heading, concerning translation principles, we endeavor insofar as possible, number one, to translate the Scriptures accurately without loss, change, distortion, or embellishment of the meaning of the original text. Accuracy in Bible translation is the faithful communication, as exactly as possible, of that meaning determined according to sound principles of exegesis. Now, of course, they don't define sound principles of exegesis, which is kind of a big hole there, but, you know, it is what it is. Number two, to communicate not only the informational content, but also the feelings and attitudes of the original text. The flavor and impact of the original should be re-expressed in forms that are consistent with normal usage in the receptor language. Number three, to preserve the variety of the original. The literary forms employed in the original text, such as poetry, prophecy, narrative, and exhortation, should be represented by corresponding forms with the similar communicative functions in the receptor language. The impact, interest, and mnemonic value of the original should be retained to the greatest extent possible. Excellent goal and well said. Number four, to represent faithfully the original historical and cultural context. Historical facts and events should be expressed without distortion. Due to differences of situation and culture, in some passages, the receptor audience may need access to additional background information in order to adequately understand the message that the original author was seeking to communicate to the original audience. Number five. To make every effort to ensure that no political, ideological, social, cultural, or theological agenda is allowed to distort the translation. Amen there. Six, to recognize that it is often necessary to restructure the form of a text in order to achieve accuracy and maximal comprehension. Since grammatical categories and syntactic structures often do not correspond between different languages, it is often impossible or misleading to maintain the same form as the source text. Changes of form will also often be necessary when translating figurative language. A translation will employ as many or as few terms as are required to communicate the original meaning as accurately as possible. And number seven, to use the original language scripture texts as the basis for translation, recognizing that these are always the primary authority. However, reliable Bible translations in other languages may be used as intermediary source texts. Now, of course, this is very general for a very large group of people, but I just want to highlight there that when you say the original language scripture texts, they kind of left that wide open in the area of textual criticism. Is it the Textus Receptus that we're going to use, or can we use an eclectic text of this or that? So it's not ideal, but I know what they're trying to do here. Now, I also want to highlight that they are saying that they want to use, that their ideal is to use the original language scripture texts as the basis for translation, okay? As the basis for translation. And I don't mean to belabor this, but I've said this before on the podcast, and I will say it again. This has not been happening for the most part. Just because you had a consultant compare the translation to the original languages does not mean that the original language scripture texts were used as the basis for the actual translation. I want to make that distinction clear. And the reason that's not happening is because we are not training the mother tongue speakers in the original languages. 
All right, we're closing that one. Now, they have a section called Concerning Translation Procedures. Here we go. We endeavor to, insofar as possible, to determine, after careful linguistic and sociolinguistic research, the specific target audience for the translation and the kind of translation appropriate to that audience. It is recognized that different kinds of translation into a given language may be valid depending on the local situation, including, for example, both more formal translations and common language translations. Number nine, to recognize that the transfer into the receptor language should be done by trained and competent translators who are translating into their mother tongue. Okay, this is key. All right, once again, the transfer into the receptor language should be done by trained and competent translators who are translating into their mother tongue. Where this is not possible, mother tongue speakers should be involved to the greatest extent possible in the translation process. So, what I'm seeing here is that the bread and butter, some of the bread and butter of what these agencies agree on is, number one, that the translation sh should be done from the original languages, and number two, they should be done by trained and competent translators who are translating into their mother tongue. So, as long as we do not train and make competent those translators in the original languages, this whole standard just falls apart. And so, I would just encourage you, if you're a donor, you're a supporter, whatever, you can have these kinds of conversations, ask hard questions, and hold member agencies accountable to their own standards. And just ask them, why haven't you been doing this as part of the core of who you are, part of the core of what you're doing? Because really, nothing could get more basic to Bible translation than these two elements coming together. This is the baseline foundation. It's not like some icing on the cake. This is really the baseline foundation that they themselves are highlighting and recognizing. All right, moving on, number 10, to give high priority to training mother tongue speakers of the receptor language in translation principles and practice and to provide appropriate professional support. Number 11, to test the translation as extensively as possible in the receptor community to ensure that it communicates accurately, clearly, and naturally, keeping in mind the sensitivities and experience of the receptor audience. Excellent. Number 12, to assess the translation in light of feedback received from a qualified consultant review or equivalent process in order to enhance the quality and appropriateness of the final product. Number 13, to choose the media for the translation that are most appropriate for the specific target audience, whether audio, visual, electronic, print, or a combination of these. This may involve making adjustments of form that are appropriate to the medium and to the cultural setting while ensuring that the translated message remains faithful to the original message. Very good. Number 14, to encourage the periodic review of translations to ascertain when revision or a new translation is needed. Also ideal. Now, concerning partnership and cooperation. They endeavor, insofar as possible, to, number 15, to organize translation projects in a way that promotes and facilitates the active participation of the Christian and wider community commensurate with local circumstances. Where there are existing churches, we will encourage these churches to be involved in the translation and to carry as much responsibility for the translation project as is feasible. Also, great ideal. Number 16, to partner and cooperate with others who are committed to the same goals. Now, concerning sign language Bible translation standards and best practices. Number 17, minimum requirement and best practice. The on-screen signer must be deaf. Number 18, 
signer and translation style must be approved by the community. This confirms that the community will watch the signer and engage with the translation style, thus preventing the output of a product the community will not use. Number 19, minimum requirement. The signer is someone who signs naturally. Best practice is the signer is a native first language signer. To sign naturally is a minimum requirement for a sign language translation, and we recognize that first language signers tend to be the most fluent of signers. Being deaf does not always imply that the person comes from a sign language background, and therefore they would not be a native signer. This ensures that the viewer will understand the content. Number 20. Minimum requirement. The translation team must have at least two individuals on the team, and at least 50% of the team must always be deaf. Best practice, the team should have at least three individuals, and at least 66% of the team must be deaf. New translation teams may be small at first. However, the majority of the team should always be deaf. This ensures ongoing community involvement in the translation project and protects the integrity of the project in the eyes of the deaf community. Hearing people and children of deaf adults can be a part of the translation team, but never the one who signs on camera. Number 21, minimum requirement is that a certified translation consultant must check and approve the translation and check it according to their organization's standards. The best practice is a certified translation consultant must check the translation and check the entire translated text, not just spot check. The consultant should be fluent in a major sign language. Translation consultants are responsible for checking the accuracy part of the translation. Depending on the skill of the consultant, they may also offer video or linguistic suggestions as well. This requirement ensures the accuracy of the translation and its faithfulness to the original text. Having fluency in a signed language ensures the consultants understand the nature of the projects they are dealing with. Number 22. Minimum requirement and best practice is that the translation consultant must be affiliated with one of FOBI's member agencies or be affirmed by the deaf development group. This is to make sure the translation consultant has met the minimum standards to be a consultant. Number 23, minimum requirement is that the translation must go through a community check process. The best practice is the community check process must use a format that makes sure at least three people are present during the check. This check should include deaf community members who are Christian and non-Christian. The whole translation should go through this process. The community check helps the translators verify that the translation is clear, accurate, natural, and acceptable to the community. Number 24, minimum requirement and best practice is that sign language translation projects that use a written form of a signed language should follow the minimum requirements and best practices for written translation. Then number 25, they have an error here. So if you're on the FOBI board and uh, you go back to this document, you might want to fix this. But what they meant to say is that the minimum requirement and best practice is that all photos, maps, and other visuals included in the translation material must be checked by a translation consultant. Number 26, minimum requirement is that all translations must use proper methods of biblical exegesis so that the resulting signed translation accurately reflects the meaning of the original text. Now, the best practice of this adds that the team must include someone who can explain the biblical text, whether a facilitator, interpreter, or exegetical advisor. This person can be either hearing or deaf. The goal of any translation project should be to have an accurate and faithful representation of the original text so that the deaf can understand God's word. Having someone on the team who can understand spoken language translations will help the team when they are using a spoken language text as their source text. As sign language source texts become available, the translation team will still need a person who can understand the sign language translation being used as the source text. Number 27, minimum requirement and best practice. 
the translation team must receive minimal training in sign language linguistics, biblical exegesis, and translation principles. Many deaf do not understand how their language works. They may also think that their language is not good enough. So the linguistic training helps them understand how their language works and why it is valuable. This will help make their translations clearer, more natural, and acceptable. Biblical exegesis and translation principles will help them improve the accuracy of their translation. Number 28, minimum requirement. The translation must involve the community in the translation process as much as possible. Now, the best practice is before beginning a translation, the team should form a translation committee composed of members of the community, church leadership, etc. This committee can support community checks and distribution, and without the involvement of the community, it is possible or even likely the scripture engagement aspect of the project will fail. Number 29, minimum requirement and best practice is the signing must be what the community is using, usually the most common variant or most accepted variant. Unless sociolinguistic factors force it, the translation team should avoid using a variant that is too, quote-unquote, educated or too, quote-unquote, rural. The translation team should use the more common or more accepted variant so that the most people will understand the translation. Now, there are a few more points here that I'm going to skip, but basically this is what we're talking about when we're talking about standards of phobi for Bible translation. And I'm reading from the statement that was approved in April of 2017, the most recent one. I think this is just a generally really good exercise to put us all on the same page because, like I said, the biggest players in Bible translation are all part of this forum or alliance. And so, if you want a one-stop shop to understand what all of these people have signed on to, whether you support Pioneer Bible Translators or The Seed Company or Wycliffe or whatever— you can see what their ideals are that they're striving for right here and I'll link it in the description. Now, they also have their own standards for consultants. So, this is interesting. Let's go ahead and read this together. It's not as long. So, just bear with me. This is the statement on qualifications for translation consultants. Here's how they introduce it. One of the ways in which the member organizations of FOBI can cooperate is in sharing our translation consultant resources as local situations, organizational policies, and availability permit. Consultants from member organizations may wish to collaborate for various purposes, such as educating church leaders, program planning and design, training translators, quality assurance of content format, etc., The goal of this statement is to define a jointly agreed set of minimum qualifications for translation consultants as a basis for sharing consultant resources in situations where this is deemed appropriate. This agreement recognizes that each organization maintains its own internal standards for consultant recognition, and thus there will need to be different levels of application between organizations to accommodate differences in their own policies. Organizations may wish to define specific requirements more explicitly in their own bilateral agreements. In particular, where an organization is a publishing partner in a joint project, this agreement recognizes that the organization may require that final checking and sign-off on publication be restricted to a those who meet the higher internal qualifications it requires of its own translation consultants and b those to whom it also specifically extends this recognition the agreement aims to ensure a standard of qualifications skills and experience that is acceptable to all organizations for sharing consultant resources in collaborative projects The statement focuses on professional qualifications. It is understood that all cooperating organizations, as members of the forum, have identified themselves as being within the mainstream of historical Christianity. So, if you're listening and you've been thinking, huh, maybe I could be a translation consultant, here's where you can get more information on what you need to do that. So, this will also be linked in the description. It starts with interpersonal skills. 
Some of the most important qualifications for a translation consultant are in the field of interpersonal relations. Consultants must have the ability to relate well with others of different cultural backgrounds. Consultants must be sensitive to different situations, tolerant of different viewpoints, able to listen and learn, and also able to give an appropriate lead when needed. They must be good teachers and able to communicate effectively, both in writing and in speaking. Now, what about academic qualifications? First, linguistics. A minimum of one academic year of training or equivalent in descriptive linguistics. Areas to be covered include sociolinguistics, phonology, grammar, discourse, studies, cognitive linguistics, pragmatics, semantics, and language typology. Cross-cultural studies, at least one graduate or upper-graduate level course in anthropology or cross-cultural studies. Number three, biblical languages. A good knowledge of New Testament Greek and or biblical Hebrew, preferably both. More precisely, the minimum standard expected is a basic knowledge of the morphology, syntax, and discourse structure of the language. One should be able to read the original text, and here they have uh, a typo. There's, they actually left out the word able, so if you're listening, you might want to fix that. So, one should be able to read the original text with understanding, with the help of reference tools, and to use commentaries that refer directly to the original text. There should be an ongoing commitment to use and develop this knowledge. Biblical studies. A minimum of one academic year of concentrated study at the graduate or upper graduate level in Old Testament and New Testament. Areas to be covered include biblical languages, principles and practice of biblical exegesis, and the historical and cultural background of the Bible. Translation consultants should normally have an MA or a PhD or the equivalent in one of the above areas or a related discipline and the minimum described above in the others. Formal qualifications may, however, occasionally be waived where the person concerned has other special strengths and or has demonstrated his or her competence through long service and or through the publications he or she has authored. Now, moving on to translation skills and experience. A consultant should A, have received training in translation principles either through participating in a formal course or through personal tutoring from an experienced consultant and have participated in translation workshops and training programs on the field. B, have had in-depth experience working in a translation project in one language over a prolonged period of time. C, be committed to the principles of functional equivalence slash meaning-based translation while also showing sensitivity to local attitudes and situations regarding specific translation styles. Language and cross-cultural skills. A consultant should have an understanding of the characteristics of the languages in the area of expected service. Usually, a consultant should also understand and be able to speak fluently at least one language of the area, including any major language spoken in the area which is likely to be a medium of interaction with translation teams and church leaders. Spanish, in my case. Language learning may often be combined with the experience of working with one translation project in depth over a period of time. This could, in some cases, be a major language of the area. A consultant should have had experience of living for an extended period of time in a culture different from his or her own. Very important. Now, what about skills in organization and planning? A consultant should have demonstrated ability to organize personal study projects and have had personal experience of cooperating in the planning and organization of a translation project. Consultancy skills. A consultant should have received training that includes an orientation to the role and responsibilities of a translation consultant, interpersonal skills, and consulting techniques. This will usually be through participating in a consultant training seminar and also through a close association with a senior consultant over a period of time in an apprenticeship or mentoring relationship. Just a quick comment there, in my humble opinion, I do not believe that consultant training seminars are worth the time and effort that are put into them. 
I think the apprenticeship or mentoring relationship is the most important aspect of this whole process. And those training seminars can be eliminated. Now, what about professional standards? Translation consultants must have a high standard of professional integrity and an ongoing commitment to increase their knowledge and develop their skills in ways that will help them to become increasingly effective in their service as consultants. The processes that contribute to consultant development will usually include formal training, personal reading and study, experience in translation and consulting, Participation in a translation consultant training seminar, which I've already said I would encourage these agencies to phase out, and an apprenticeship slash mentoring relationship with one or more experienced consultants. Now, there's a final blurb about formal recognition of consultants that I'm going to skip, but there you have it. This is the one-stop shop for understanding the general guidelines for what you need to become a consultant. Now, of course, as we've mentioned before, there are those who would argue that we need to move away from the consultant model and become more church-centric in Bible translation and actually equip everyone who's involved in the translation with the resources that they need, or at the very least, offer consulting services to those who want them but not impose them as a requirement before they can publish anything or get funding. In the same vein of pushing back on established norms, if we look at those translation best practices. The question is, are we as Bible agencies that are composed of mostly rich Western people, a kind of Christian colonialism on the rest of the church? By requiring the rest of the global church to abide by these standards that we've created in order to get funding or publishing options or to use the over a thousand resources in Paratext. Most would say, well, of course, if you want to play with our money and our expensive toys, you have to abide by our rules. And others might say, well, this is a missiological issue. This is a biblical issue. Should these parachurch ministries or organizations be put in the place where they enforce these standards with the local churches? Or in other words, should they be in authority over the body of Christ or should it be the other way around? just some food for thought. What do you think? I have an email address. It's on my new webpage, workingfortheword.com. So you can go check that out. Feel free to write me what you think about some of these questions. In other words, should we be radically generous with our tools and resources and serve the church with no strings attached? Or Should we be generous only on certain conditions? Should we serve the global church by offering wisdom, instruction, insight, and our opinion on what should be the best practices, or should we use our position to tell people how they must translate if they want our help? So these are really hard questions, and both sides have their strong and valid arguments. At the same time, we live in a world that is moving more and more towards decentralization, where people are growing weary of big conglomerates controlling everything. And sin is always in the mix, right? Making everything more messy and complicated, even when there are well-meaning people on both sides. So, may God give us wisdom to navigate all of this with love, joy, humility, and understanding. And that about wraps it for this episode. This is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. And this podcast exists ultimately to help us treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.